It's good to be back. I walked in this morning and somebody said, look, we have a first time guest. And I said, yeah, and I expect to be treated really well today too, by the way. But no, it is great to be back with you guys. All right, well, let's get started. One of the most common questions I get asked as a pastor is, what is God's will for my life? Now, it's normally not phrased like that. It may take this form. Who should I marry? What kind of guy or girl should I marry and spend the rest of my life with? Or, or maybe it's what should I major in in college? Or, or what job or career will best fit me and what God wants from me? Maybe it's should I go into full-time ministry? A lot of times I get asked this by parents, what should we do as a family to help our kids grow in their relationship with Jesus? If you don't realize it, every one of those questions is really asking, what's God's plan for me? What, what, what does God want from me next? And I think I get asked this question a lot because it can be confusing for us. It can be frustrating for us because a lot of times we can't see the destination from where we stand right now. We can't see where it is that God is ultimately leading us to. But the problem with this isn't God's plan. The problem is that we misunderstand how God reveals his plan or we just don't like how God reveals his plan. And I, so often I think we want more of like a fortune teller, right, that tells us this is exactly where you're headed and this is the way you get there and there are really good things that are going to happen to you if you do those things. And, and so really what we're looking for, if you think about this like a map of driving directions, think about it this way. If you look at a map, this is directions from this church building down to Energy Stadium. And this is really what we want. We want a map that shows us where we are, that where the destination is, and every single turn along the way. And if you follow that map, you can get down to Energy and see the rodeo and see George Strait in concert one last time, which I've done, and then he's been in concert again, so it doesn't really work his last time, but that'll get you there. But God really doesn't reveal his plan to us in that way. Do you guys remember the old turn-by-turn -turn directions that you used to print out before we had maps in our cars, and you'd print out every turn along the way? That's a little more like how God's plan looks for us. It's kind of a turn-by-turn. -turn. So this is some turn-by-turn -turn directions to get us from this church building down to Energy Stadium, where again, you can see the concert or whatever it is you're doing. But the problem with that is God usually doesn't give us every turn right up front. Instead, what he does is he just gives us the next turn, what's in front of us. And we may not know ultimately where we're going, and he says, go here, go there, do this, do that. And we don't fully understand, and that can be frustrating for us. But if we follow God's will and we take those turn-by-turn -turn directions that God gives us, eventually we're going to be able to look back and go, Wow, I kind of see what God was putting together. I see his bigger plan starting to take shape. And, and then sometimes we make this whole thing more complex because we'll take a wrong turn. We'll kind of go our own way for a while and we'll get lost along the way. And so we're no longer following God's turn-by-turn -turn directions. Instead, we're just kind of going the way we feel like or what we think is best. But here's the awesome thing about our God. When we get ready to follow God again, he is ready right then to begin to tell you where to go and give you turn-by-turn -turn directions. I'm living proof of this because I was called to preach when I was in high school. But I took a little turn, went off on my own way. I went to law school, and for 17 years, I ran from God. That's a pretty big turn out of God's plan. But then when I was ready and I answered God's call to preach, look where I am. 14 years later, I'm at a church where Lil and I planted. God began to use me and put me back into his will even when I had made my own, when went my own way for a period of time. And look, I don't know where I'd be today if I had gone straight to seminary and straight into ministry. I might be the pastor of some huge multi-site church. I also might already be burnt out selling used cars somewhere. Here's what I know. If I had not done what I did, I wouldn't be here today with you guys. And I wouldn't change that for the world. God put me into a place when I was willing to be in his will and he prepared me for that, that moment. Now, some of the turns in my life have been pretty unexpected. Some of them have been fairly painful. I've been hurt along the way. But all of those things, all of those turns have brought me to where I am today. And so the question for me today is, 
what does God want from me now? What is my next turn given where I am? Because I am who God has made me and I am the mistakes that I've made. Everything that has led me has led me to this point. And so what does God want from me given all my past decisions, all my past successes and failures, even my past hurts and the things that have been done to me? What is God's next step for me? And really, that's the same question that I want you to ask yourself as we go through the sermon today is, what is God looking for me now? With everything that has been to this point and where I am, what does God want from me today? Well, today we're wrapping up our short summer sermon series on the life of Joseph in the Old Testament. And if you've been here for this whole series, you know that there have been a lot of turn by turns for Joseph to get to this point in time. A lot of unexpected things have happened to him. And so I want to start by kind of catching you up and kind of doing a a turn-by-turn past of some different turns that Joseph's life has taken headed up to the story today. So when he was a young boy, he was the favorite son of his father, Jacob. Jacob loved him more than all of his other brothers. And so he had the, the, you know, the Technicolor dream coat, if you've seen the musical, that he wore around and he kind of got to brag and show off. He also had dreams from God, and one of the dreams was that all his brothers would bow down to him at some point. And he thought it was a good idea to tell his brothers about that. It it was not a good idea. And his brothers began to hate him because he was the favorite son and because he was treated differently and because he was a little arrogant about the whole thing. And so that's going to lead to a very unexpected and unpleasant turn in his life, which is the next turn. They throw him in a pit. His brothers catch him out one day. They throw him in a pit. They talk about killing him. They think about killing him. Then they decide, you know what? We're just going to sell him into slavery to some people that were headed to Egypt. So they sell him into slavery, and he goes to Egypt, and he winds up in as a slave. And think about that. Suddenly, he is, works, he's for, has a wealthy dad, Jacob, who has lots of fields, lots of uh, servants, and he is the guy. He is the next in line. He is the one that gets to watch his brothers work hard. He gets to do whatever he wants. He gets treated differently. And suddenly, he's a slave in a foreign country. But, but Joseph's next turn is a pretty good one. He actually winds up as a slave in a guy named Potiphar's house. And Potiphar was one of the close advisors of the Egyptian pharaoh, the king. And so he's in a pretty good gig because he rises through the ranks. And eventually, he becomes the head of Pharaoh's whole, I mean, the head of Potiphar's whole household. And so now he's in charge of all the other slaves. He's in charge of all of Potiphar's finances, all of his fields, all of the different things going on. And so things are pretty good. But, but the next turn is unexpected. He is confronted by Potiphar's wife. She wants him to sleep with her. And he refuses. And then so she lies to Potiphar and tells Potiphar that Joseph tried to rape her. Well, that winds him up in prison. That was, not, that was not a turn that the dude was expecting. But he was in prison, and suddenly things start to change even there. He is put in charge of the prison. He is so effective at leadership that he's put in charge of the whole prison. And the warden says, you just run things, and I'll just kind of watch. So he's in charge of all the other prisoners. He's in charge of this big operation. But even more important than that, he meets a couple of people who've been thrown into prison who are very close advisors to the Egyptian Pharaoh, and he actually interprets dreams for them because God gave him the ability to interpret dreams. And and that's going to kind of lead us into the next big turn, is he is going to interpret Pharaoh's dream. What happens is Pharaoh has a couple of dreams that he doesn't understand. They're very disturbing to him, and nobody can figure out what's going on, what his dreams are about. And then one of these officials who had been in prison that he'd interpreted the dream for was now back close working for Pharaoh again. He goes, hey, I know a guy that can help you out. So they bring Joseph out of prison, and he interprets Pharaoh's dream. And and what he tells Pharaoh is, look, what your dream means is that there's going to be seven years of great prosperity. Man, crops are going to grow different than they've grown before. Things are going to be awesome and amazing. But then there's going to be seven years of terrible famine. And, And so this is a warning for Egypt to begin to prepare, to save some of the grain and some of the other produce to get ready for this seven years of famine. And as Pharaoh talks to Joseph and kind of works with him a little bit, he's really impressed with Joseph, his ability 
to, to know what God is saying through dreams, but also just his wisdom and leadership. And so this last turn for Joseph to get us to where we are today is a pretty cool turn. He is now the man in charge. He is second in command of all of Egypt. Pharaoh says, look, you get us ready during these seven years of prosperity, and you lead us through the seven years of famine. And so the only man with more power in all of Egypt than Joseph is Pharaoh. So I'm sure at this point, (laughs) he's starting to see God's plan, right? He's looking back at his turn by turns and some things that didn't make sense originally looking back kind of makes some sense again. Because if he hadn't been sold into slavery, he wouldn't have been in Egypt to be in this situation. If he hadn't have been sent to prison, he wouldn't have been able to interpret dreams and grow in his leadership and be able to be in a situation where Pharaoh could use him. And so he can look back at some of those hurts and some of those difficulties and he can see God's plan and he can see where he is now. But Joseph still has one big turn left, and it's going to be a tough one that he has to make. That's where our story is today. Here's his last turn to stay in God's will. He's got to forgive his brothers. Man, think about that. I don't want to just minimize this before we get to the story, because what did they do to him? He's 17 years old. He is the son. He loves his dad. His dad loves him, and they were going to kill him. They hated him. They tried to destroy his life. They sold him into slavery expecting that eventually he would just die in Egypt. They tried to destroy his life. And so now in our story today, Joseph has to decide, can he forgive? Can he let go of what was some terrible, terrible stuff that was done to him? All right, as our story picks up today, we're during this seven years of famine. And Joseph's family, they live back in Canaan, which is not too far from Egypt, but far enough that it's a pretty good little trip by donkey. And they're going through the same famine now that Egypt is going through, and they run out of food. And so they got to do something to figure out what to get new food. And they hear about, man, Egypt's got lots of food. They've been saving up all this food. They've been prepared for this famine. And so Jacob decides to send 10 of his sons down to Egypt to buy grain so they can get some more food. He doesn't send his youngest son, Benjamin, and that's going to be important in a minute. He doesn't send Benjamin because Benjamin is now his favorite. Joseph, he thinks Joseph's dead. His brothers told him that he'd been killed by a wild animal. So now Benjamin is his new favorite. Why he kept picking favorites, I don't know, but he did. And now Benjamin is his favorite. So he sends the other brothers down to Egypt. All right, let's pick up our story in Genesis 42, 6 through 9. This is when the brothers get to where Joseph is in Egypt. Now, Joseph was the governor of the land, the person who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. Remember that? That's a little dream he had. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from? He asked. From the land of Canaan, they replied, to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Then he remembered his dreams about them, and he said to them, you are spies, You've come to see where our land is unprotected. So Joseph is kind of in a powerful situation now, right? His brothers that have done him so wrong need him. But he can also do whatever he wants to his brothers at this point. He can not give them grain. He can throw them in prison. He can put them into slavery. He can have them killed the way they wanted to have him killed. He can do all of those things. He's in that position. But God has a different plan. God wants to bring healing and restoration to this family, these sons of Jacob. Now, if you know much about the Old Testament, you know why it's so important that they will restore. Because these 12 sons of Jacob start the 12 tribes of Israel that will carry all the way through. And, And so that's God's plan is to bring forgiveness and restoration. But as they get there, Joseph asks his brother some questions about the family. And these are questions, obviously, that he already knows the answer to because he was part of the family, but they don't know that. And so he finds out about Benjamin and that his youngest brother, his full brother by his same mom, is not there. And so then he says, you know what? You guys are spies. And if you want to prove to me you're not spies, you'll go home and leave one of the brothers here as for me to make sure you come back and you'll bring your younger brother Benjamin is a good faith sign 
to show me that you're not actually spies. And, and so as you'd expect, man, these brothers are floored by this because they don't know this is their brother. They just know this crazy Egyptian official is accusing them of being spies and telling them they got to go home and get the, the brother that their dad loves the most and bring back. And, and they start to think, you know what? This is God punishing us. This is God punishing us for what we did to Joseph all those years ago. But that's actually not what's happening here. God is preparing everybody's heart for forgiveness and restoration. Look at Genesis 42, 21 through 28. This is the brothers, what they think is going on. They said to one another, surely we are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen. That's why this distress has come on us. Reuben replied, didn't I tell you not to sin against that boy? But you wouldn't listen. Now we must give an accounting for his blood. They did not realize that Joseph could actually understand them since he had been using an interpreter. He turned away from them and began to weep. But then he came back and spoke to them again. He had Simeon, that's one of the brothers, taken from them and bound up before their eyes. Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain, to put each man's silver back in his sack and to give them provisions for their journey. And this was done for them. They loaded up their grain on their donkeys and they left. At the place where they stopped for the night, one of them opened the sack to get feed for his donkey and he saw all the silver in the mouth of the sack. That's what they used to pay for the the grain. My silver has been returned, he said to his brothers. Here it is in my sack. Their hearts sank and they turned to each other trembling and said, what is this that God has done to us? So they're in this moment, it's already bad. They've lost one of their brothers. Simeon is now stuck in Egypt. They're told they have to go get their youngest brother and come back. They've got this crazy Egyptian official that they can't figure out. And then at night, they open up their sacks of grain, and there's all the money, all the silver that they paid for that grain. So now they're thinking, they're going to think we stole that grain. So in addition to being spies, they're going to be thought to be thieves from one of the greatest nations in all the known world at that point in time. Well, things kind of go from bad to worse. They get home, and their father Jacob is not happy. He's, not, he's angry at them that they messed up the whole go, just go buy some grain trip. He's devastated that another one of his sons is now lost probably forever. But Jacob refuses to allow them to take Benjamin back. He says, you're not taking my youngest back. We're just going to leave Simeon. What happened to Simeon happened to Simeon, and we're just going to kind of deal with it. But eventually they run out of grain again. Now they got to go buy more food, and they got a problem at this point because they got to go deal with this crazy Egyptian official who's accused them of being being spies. And so they got to take the younger brother. So they plead with their dad, Jacob, let us take Benjamin. Let us take Benjamin. And finally he agrees. And so they make the trip back to Egypt with Benjamin to buy additional grain. Let's pick up the story in Genesis 43, 16 to 23, where the brothers are going to meet Joseph again. When Joseph saw that Benjamin was with them, he said to the steward of his house, take these men to my house, slaughter an animal, and prepare a meal. They are to eat with me at noon. The men did as Joseph told him and took the men to Joseph's house. Now the men were frightened when they were taken to his house. They thought, we were brought here because of that silver that was put back in our sacks the first time. He wants to attack us and overpower us and seize us as slaves and take our donkeys. So they went up to Joseph's steward and spoke to him at the entrance of his house. We beg your pardon, our Lord, they said. We came down here the first time to buy food, but at the place where we stopped for the night, we opened our sacks, and each of us found his silver, the exact weight in the mouth of his sack. So we brought it back with us, and we've also brought some additional silver with us to buy more food. We we don't know who put the silver in our sacks. It's all right, he said. Don't be afraid. Your God, the God of your father, has given you treasure in your sacks. I received your silver. Then he brought their brother Simeon out to them. So they brought back all the silver that had been put back in their sacks to explain, look, we didn't steal. We don't know what happened, but here it is. And they brought some more silver to buy more grain. And and so Joseph has them given more grain, given some supplies to get back, and he he sends them on their way after they eat with him. But Joseph still has one more little thing he's going to do. He has all the silver put back in their sacks again, But this time, he also has his personal expensive silver drinking cup put in Benjamin's sack. And so the brothers start to leave town, and it's when they get to the edge of the city. The steward and some guards catch up with them and accuse them of stealing again, and they plead their innocence. We we didn't do it. But then they say, well, let us look in the sacks. And they look in the sacks, they find all the silver again, 
And then in Benjamin's sack, they find Joseph's silver drinking cup. And so all the brothers are accused of, of stealing, and they're taken back into the city, and they're brought back before Joseph again. And Joseph said, look, Benjamin is now a slave. He's going to stay here because he stole my personal drinking cup. And the brothers plead and say, it will destroy our dad. You can't do that. One of the brothers offers and says, look, keep me instead. I'll be a slave here in Egypt, but let Benjamin go home. And then look at how this story ends in Genesis 45, 1 through 7. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, have everybody leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I'm Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers, they weren't even able to answer him because they were terrified in his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I'm your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there's been famine in the land. And for the next five years, there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for your remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. This is the moment of forgiveness. He breaks down. And in this moment, think about that. Joseph can see God's full plan. He can look all the way back and see every turn by turn and how it led him to this point. Even the pain that he'd experienced when his brothers had betrayed him and sold him into slavery. But in the end, it took Joseph forgiving for God's will to be complete. And so after Joseph visits with his brothers and they kind of restore their relationship, he sends them back to Canaan with lots of silver and lots of supplies. But he also sends them back with an invitation to bring the whole family, including his father, back to Egypt, to live in Egypt until the famine is over. And they'll wind up staying there a lot longer than that. And so they go and they bring the dad back and they all move back to Egypt, and Pharaoh gives them the best land in all of Egypt to farm. And so we kind of have a happily ever after story in this situation. There's forgiveness and restoration. But don't forget, there were a lot of twists and turns along the way. So let me ask you, what does your turn-by-turn history look like? Well, what is it that's happened to you that has you where you are today? Well, what are your successes and your failures? What are the decisions that you've made that have led you to this moment in time? Well, what are the hurts that have been done to you in your turn by turn? Some of you guys have been hurt pretty bad by something or someone throughout your life. Some of you may still be carrying the baggage of that moment. Years later, you're still struggling with forgiveness. And, and if that's you, you're at a crossroad. You're at a big turn-by-turn -turn direction in God's will for your life. You have the same choice that Joseph did. Will you forgive? Will you let that anger and that bitterness go? I, I say this with all the confidence that I have in God's word in the Bible. It is God's will for you to let go of that bitterness and that anger. That could not be more clear from the Bible. And if you came into church today carrying some anger or bitterness against someone else, or maybe it's even against God, I believe that today is the day you can let that go. I can't preach well enough to make you let that go. But I believe that the power of God in your willing heart will allow you to be set free today if you're willing. God makes that clear. Today is the day. That is the next turn for you on your map, without question. That's what God wants for you to stay in his will. And look, I get that we're all in different places when it comes to forgiveness. Some of you guys have been hurt really bad by something that somebody's done to you. Maybe that was a few weeks ago or a few months ago. Maybe it was years ago. But you're at a place where you just, you don't know that you can give that up, that you can ever let that go. That bitterness and anger, it's become kind of a part of who you are at this point. Maybe your kids have never seen the you that doesn't carry around that baggage. Maybe you don't even remember the you that was before that hurt and the anger and that bitterness. 
But if you really want to be in God's will for your life, you will forgive. And, and if you can find a way to do that, I promise you, it's going to change your life for the better. Let go of your anger and your bitterness. The Bible talks a lot about forgiveness. I know that probably doesn't surprise most of you, but the Apostle Paul says it this way in Colossians 3.13. He says, bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Listen to this next part. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Paul says, you've been forgiven of a whole lot by God. Now it's your turn. Forgive someone else. Notice that Paul doesn't put limitations on that. He doesn't say, look, forgive if it wasn't that big a deal. He doesn't say forgive once the person makes it right. He doesn't even say forgive after the person asks for forgiveness. He says forgive, period. We love to talk about God's grace for us, right? I mean, grace is awesome. Grace is amazing. God's grace is what saves us. It's what forgives us. But grace is a two-way street. We sometimes forget that. We've been shown so much grace by God, and now we're told to give grace and forgive other people. We're to give that same grace the way we've received it. Listen to how Jesus says this and how serious he is about this issue of forgiveness. This is Matthew 6, 14 through 15, and this is Jesus talking here. He says, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will will not forgive you of your sins. That's kind of tough. That's some tough talk by Jesus. What he's saying is forgiveness isn't an option. It's not limited. It's not intended to just be in minimal circumstances where things are just done to you a little wrong or when someone else makes it right or when they apologize. He says, if you claim to be my follower, then you will forgive, period. Man, this may not seem fair to you if you're in this situation. But I promise you, if you can forgive, if you can let go of the bitterness, your life will change dramatically for the better. You know, as kids, we had this very simplistic view of forgiveness. And I talked about this a couple months ago, but I'm going to go into a lot more detail today. I said a couple months ago, and I'll say it again today, that the childlike understanding of forgiveness is this. Here's the two sides, the apology and the acceptance. This is how it works. Someone messes up. They say they're sorry, and then you forgive them. If you've got multiple kids, you know how this works. You know, when you know, the little brother decides to brush his sister's hair with the, uh, I don't know, you know, the blender, <laughs> and it causes some problems, and you say, look, apologize to your sister. And he apologized, and he said, now you accept, and you guys hug it out. That's a very childlike view, two, two sides, apology and acceptance. And, and you know, that works even as adults in pretty minor circumstances, if it's just a little mistake or it's a simple misunderstanding or maybe minor hurt, that still works today. But that kind of breaks down when the world gets messy, when the hurt is deep, when it's gone for a long time, an apology may never happen. What is accurate about this childlike understanding of forgiveness is that there are two sides to forgiveness but it's not the apology and the acceptance. Here are the real two sides to forgiveness, the before and the after. You don't have to have an apology. There doesn't have to be anyone make it right. That's important. That's it. If you're still struggling with bitterness and anger about some hurt that's been done to you in your past, man, you know all about one side. You know all about the before. The before of forgiveness, you know, man, it wears you down. It's filled with anger and sadness and depression. You, you feel the tightness in your chest and in your shoulders every time you think about what was done to you or the person who wronged you. And you know that the before is it's destroying your self-esteem. It's, it's poisoning your attitude about other people and your relationships. It keeps you from really enjoying the good things around you. It keeps you from being the best husband or wife or parent or child or friend that you need to be. You know that the before of forgiveness affects your sleep. It affects your attitude and your health. It, it even affects your relationship with Jesus because you know you're supposed to forgive, but you just can't seem to make it happen. You only know one side of forgiveness. That's where you are. And that other side, the after, it seems like it's so far away. It seems like it's impossible to achieve. But see, we worship an all-knowing, all-powerful God. And he doesn't just see the hurt of the before. 
he also sees the freedom in the after. He knows the hurt you're going through, but he knows what's waiting for you if you can just stay in his will, if you can just take that step and take that one big turn in God's roadmap for your life. It's going to change everything. Now, let me be clear about this. Grown-up forgiveness is tough. It's not this childlike exercise. It hurts deep. It takes effort. It takes humility. You may have to forgive over and over. You may have to keep forgiving every day. You may have to forgive multiple times a day until the healing from the other side begins to take place. It's difficult and messy, but you can experience the other side of forgiveness. You know, forgiveness also doesn't mean that you necessarily go have, you know, tea and fruitcake or whatever it is you do. I, don't, I hate fruitcake. I don't even know why I said that. But <laughs> you don't have to do that. Now, restoration of the relationship is usually possible. And when that's possible, just like with Joseph, it's the best case scenario. But the reality is you may not even be in a situation where that relationship can be restored. It may be a past husband or a wife. Can't fix that. Or, and sometimes restoration of the relationship isn't best for you. And it's not best for the people that you care deeply about. But you don't have to renew the relationship to forgive. Here is the truth. That if you can accept this and understand this and live this out, it's going to change your life. Forgiveness is way more about you than it is about the person you're forgiving. That makes sense? It is way less about that person over there that hurt you, and it's way more about your heart and your relationships and your freedom. I want to read some excerpts from an article from the Mayo Clinic called Forgiveness, Letting Go of Grudges and Bitterness. And a lot of you guys are familiar with the Mayo Clinic. They're one of the best diagnostic hospitals in really the entire world. You've probably gone to their website and looked to try to figure out if you're dying or if you just have a cold, one of the two, you can't figure out which. You've been on their website. But I want to read an article or a little excerpt from an article. And they kind of set this up as like questions and then they'll answer their own question. And this is about forgiveness. And you need to understand that Mayo Clinic is not a Christian organization. They're not a church. They're just a good hospital. All right, let's look at a couple of excerpts from that. Here's the first question. What if the person I'm forgiving doesn't change? Well, here's the answer. Getting another person to change his or her actions, behavior, or words isn't the point of forgiveness. Think of forgiveness more about how it can change your life by bringing you peace and happiness and emotional and spiritual healing. Forgiveness can take away the power the other person continues to wield in your life. What that's saying is forgiveness is more about you than it is about the person that you're forgiving. All right, here's the, the other question that I pulled out. What are the benefits of forgiving someone? And then here was their answer. Letting go of grudges and bitterness can make way for improved health and peace of mind. Forgiveness can lead to healthier relationships, improved mental health, less anxiety and less stress and hostility, lower blood pressure, fewer symptoms of depression, a stronger immune system, improved heart health, improved self-esteem. That's the Mayo Clinic. <laughs> That's not a Christian organization telling you to forgive. That is someone saying, here's the reason Jesus probably said that 2,000 years ago, or at least one of the reasons, because it is what's best for you. And so if we know it's best for us to forgive, and we know that Jesus says to forgive, why do we hold on to that? Why do we not let it go? You know, as a pastor, I, I visit a whole lot with people about their past, their hurts, and the things that have happened to them, and I counsel with people about that. And several years ago, I counseled with a lady who told me that back in high school, a, a young high school boy had really taken advantage of her and hurt her in a pretty devastating way. And all these years later, she was still struggling. This, this boy had never apologized. He had never tried to make it right. And she said, you know, the most frustrating thing to me is I'll go on Facebook and I see pictures of this man now with his family. He's got this young family and they're all so happy. And she said, I still can't have a normal dating relationship because of what he did to me. And it feels so unfair. There's just no justice in what happened. And she said, it feels like that if I let the bitterness go, I'm letting him off the hook. That I'm just kind of washing the thing and there's no justice for what was done. And I told her, I said, what was done to you was terrible. It was wrong and, and he ought to make it right. But, but that may never happen. But, but what's happening to you now 
is you're letting something that happened to you 20 years ago continue to destroy your life. Now, that boy probably doesn't even know the impact it still has in your life. But a lack of forgiveness was tearing her apart inside. Some of you guys, you're right where she was. You just, you can't seem to let it go. And it feels like that if you let go of the anger and the bitterness, you're just letting the person off the hook, that there's no justice if you do that. And look, I get that, but you're wrong about justice. God handles the justice. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 12, 19. He says, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. God's being pretty clear here. He'll take care of the justice. And I think sometimes we forget that, that we don't just worship a God of love. We worship a God of justice, a good and right judge who will make things right. That's why we talk so much about sin and about punishment and about repentance because we know God is a just God. You're not letting go of retribution. You're not giving up justice. You're just letting God handle justice in his perfect wisdom. And you're setting yourself free to the good things in life. And let me be clear. Because God is a God of justice, there will be justice. Either at the foot of the cross, if they repent of their sins and follow Jesus, or in a place called hell. Because we worship a just God, and he will handle that on your behalf. So set yourself free. See, when you don't forgive, you're just hurting you. I've heard it said that bitterness is kind of like drinking poison, hoping it'll hurt somebody else. And that's really true. Freedom comes into forgiveness. So we need to live in a constant state of forgiveness, even for the terrible wrongs that have been done to us. Jesus sees the other side. He wants that for you. He wants to set you free. Listen to what Jesus says in John 10.10. 10. He's talking about Satan here. He says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I love how the message paraphrase kind of paraphrase this same verse. It says, a thief is only there to steal and kill and destroy. I came so that they can have real and eternal life, more and better life than they ever even dreamed of. That's what Jesus is saying to you. He's saying, Satan wants to keep you in the before of forgiveness because the before of forgiveness, it, it steals your joy. It kills your hope. It destroys your self-esteem. But Jesus wants to give you the fullness of life. He wants you to feel the freedom of the other side because it's in the after, the other side, where we experience all of the fullness that he wants. Think for just a minute about the forgiveness of God, what his grace looks like. Your sin, my sin, put Jesus on the cross, and yet he forgives us. But, but think about it even from this perspective. Jesus is hanging on the cross and he's looking down at the men who put him there. And what does he say? Forgive them, Father. They don't really understand what they just did. In that moment, they're killing him. And he's forgiving them. That's what grace is. That's what grace looks like. Grace is great enough to forgive you no matter what you've done, no matter how many mistakes you've made. But grace is also great enough to allow you to forgive. And if you can let that bitterness go, it's going to change everything. Let's pray.